folks, welcome back to my channel. You can call me Lolly. Today we are going to be talking about all of the books that I read in the month of November. I have nine books to talk about, so we'll see if this video is any shorter than my most recent wrap-ups. Juggling multiple notebooks. Because we are only moderately organized chaos over here. The first book I'll mention is The Master Butcher Singing Club by Louise Erdich. I'm actually not going to talk about this because it is published by HarperCollins, and if you are unaware, HarperCollins workers are currently on strike. This is At the time that I'm filming this, I believe it's day 17 that they have been walking a picket line in front of the HarperCollins office. One of the ways they have asked people to um, support the workers is to withhold publishing reviews about their books. And they might be talking about like reviews for new books more than like old stuff that is not super, that the sales are not super dependent on um, reviews. But regardless, I'll talk about that at another time. I will also have um, information in my description box about um, where you can find more information about the strike and how to support the workers, including a link to um, if you want to uh, support their strike fund, um, because hey, their past two weeks of having worked with no pay during the holidays, during a recession. Um, so I will have information about that in the description box if you would like to learn more. Next, uh, the first book I finished that took me a hot minute to finish, uh, The Omnivore's Dilemma, A Natural History of Four Meals by Michael Pollan. Um, look at, can you, can you even see all of these tabs? Um, where did I talk about this? Was it, there was a recent tag video? I think it was my nonfiction on booktube tag that I did recently where I, I mentioned um, maybe the question was like, what's your favorite nonfiction book you've read this year or something? And that's like, it's this. <laughs> um, so this is a nonfiction book following, narrated from the perspective of this investigative journalism, Michael Pollan, who um, explores the source of food in America. Um, that's not a very good description. Um, he's basically examining our industrial food system, the organic food farming system, looking at food production and sourcing and growing and marketing and all of that um, w within America. So he start the first section, it's, he talks about corn as kind of the uh, uh, jumping off point to talk about industrial food. He talks about how corn to be came to be fucking everywhere. Why do we use corn syrup instead of sugar? Why are we feeding corn to cattle who are not evolved to eat grain? They're evolved to eat grass. And kind of, and the culmination of that meal is the fast food meal. I think purchased at the McDonald's. I don't remember if he actually mentions which fast food restaurant, but he's he's taught he looks at industrial agriculture. Mo giant industrial monoculture farms, um, industrial um, meat agriculture. Part two is about pastoral grass, um, and it kind of more looks at organic farming, also talking about big organic, like industrial organic farming. It's interesting because this book, when was this book published? So this book was published in 2006, so that's 16 years ago. And I want to bring that up because in talking about big organic, he's talking about whole foods. And I believe that that is, or like this book takes place before whole foods was acquired by Amazon. But with that, that knowledge, um, the way he talks about uh, industrial organic and places and like, and you know, whole foods and stuff like that. It's like, yeah, the writing's on the wall, but you know, some a market like Whole Foods would be bought up by Amazon. Like, that tracks. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, but with that, he also looks at, like, actual organic farmers who are trying to produce on a larger scale, producing, lar you know, producing enough food to actually source to restaurants and, and some grocery stores, you know, producing beyond the farmer's market. Um, and kind of looking at what's different, um, what, are, what are the risks in that, what are the benefits. Um, and part of that chapter is also um, 
going to a a farm where they grow and slaughter their own chickens and he takes part in that and it's it's a very interesting chapter because he like the biggest like thing is there are people in the community who walk up who they you know they slaughter the chickens in the morning and people show up at a certain time to claim the chicken that they have um pre-purchased and there's nothing to stop them from showing up early enough to actually witness the the slaughter and processing processing of their meat and that's like a huge difference between this particular organic farmer and industrial um meat manufacturing plants and um and then that's kind of like representative of like the whole thread of this book is is examining how how the average food consumer in America how removed we are from where our food comes from um, and the book finishes off with uh, part three, The Forest, and it's about foraging. It's about people who are hunting wild game rather than eating um, even, like, organic farm-raised animals. Um, foraging for mushrooms, foraging, you know, other kind of things that are wild-grown rather than even just farmed. Um, and looking at the various ethical uh, conversations involved in that. And that's the section that when he talks about hunting, because he makes an attempt to actually, like, go hunting and learn how to, like, dress the... I think they go hunting for wild wild boar or wild pig. Um, and he's involved in, in, like, the dressing of the animal that has been shot. And that's a very different experience from like a farm experience. And that is the point where he talks about like the ethics of, the ethics involved in eating meat. Um, and I think he, there, I, there's so much I love about this book, not just like the information, not just like his writing. Um, I love investigative journalism where the writer is very clearly immersed in it, um, whether it's clear it while you're reading it or not, um, there's something about like accepting that this, that researching this is also a personal journey. There's something about that particular style of investigative journalism, nonfiction that I love. Um, and I've started listing the things I love because another thing I love is the way he chose to organize how he presents his information. I think he did a great job starting with industrial food um, because that's kind of like, that's what most of us, you know, unless you live on a farm and are, are grow up um, growing and being involved in your own food production, most of us, for the most part, are consuming some level of industrially processed food. And you would think that talking about like industrial meat is where we would talk, where he would talk about the ethics of eating meat, but no, he saves it to the end. He saves it to the end. And I, there's something about like that flow of thought and information that is very appropriate because we see, because by this point in the book, we have both seen like the worst of it and also like the best of it. There's a lot of arguments about whether or not animals feel pain, whether they have a no foreknowledge of death. And he's like, the thing is, like, for a lot of it, we're guessing we don't really know. Um, we can kind of tell when they are in active pain. We can also tell when they seem to be happy or when they seem to be maybe not happy in like a human emotional sense, but fulfilled in their animal needs. And he sees that in like the some of the grass-fed organic cattle that he sees where it's like, yeah, clearly in this moment they seem happy, they don't seem to stress, they are socializing the way that we think they are, they, you know, they don't seem to live in fear. Yeah, anyway, um, I don't want to wax, <laughs> you know, I, I could make a 30 minute, I could make like an hour-long video like just talking about this book. You know, I'm hopefully gonna already edit down the 15 minutes that I've already <laughs> on. It's definitely one of my favorite nonfiction. It might be one of my favorite books that I've read all year. So if this has been on your radar and you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It's it's very, very thought provoking in a way that's... I didn't find it preachy. I felt like there was a lot of here's the information 
and maybe some here's what I the author was wrestling with but he also does a pretty good job of pulling in other perspectives He's, he might be clear about where he lands on how he feels about it, but he's not dictating that you, the reader, need to agree with him wholeheartedly. Hurrah. Hurrah. Next, we have um, a book that I actually won in a Goodreads giveaway, one of the few physical books I've ever won. Um, and it's funny because I had like originally entered into it because like the premise sounded kind of interesting, and then the more reviews I, I saw, I was like, Um, and they were having, like, the giveaway kept being reopened, and I kept being prompted to, like, apply and apply and apply for another copy. And I finally stopped applying, and then, uh, they gave me a copy anyway. <laughs> so, uh, this is The Saints of Swallow Hill by Donna Everhart, author of The Education of Dixie Dupree. I'm not familiar with this author. Um, so this is a historical fiction, like, early 1930s, Depression-era America. Um... Mostly North Carolina on a um, turpentine um, farming re camp, um, and the turpentine is um, f gathered, acquired from the sap of these particular pine trees. So we follow um, a young man who makes his way to that camp after... Um, um, getting having having some confrontation with his boss at his old old job and he's like hmm I think my boss may have tried to kill me because I slept with his wife oops <laughs> it, it's like very big it's like the very beginning of the book like it's it's character set up it's not really a spoiler but clearly this his boss has it in for him so he uh, decides to skip town and find work elsewhere and he finds work at this uh, termitine farm um, and then we also follow another perspective of a young woman whose husband dies by accident, but um, she, there are some people, there is someone who, because she was the only one around when her husband died, this other person um, is kind of threatening to tell people that she killed him as a way to pressure her to do something else. So also fleeing an unsafe situation, she disguises herself as a man and goes to work at this turpentine farm. Um, and she and her husband had been turpentine far- I don't know if it's farmers, turpentine laborers. She and her husband had um, done some turpentine distilling on their own land, so she knew what the work was. You know, she's not picking up this work um, with no experience. Um, so she disguises herself as a man, and it's- just a very, like, solid historical fiction, you know, these two characters, her in disguise, they build up a rapport, you know, she's kind of struggling to keep up with the men, like, she's, she's doing good, but, I mean, she just can't quite keep up with the men laborers around her. Which wouldn't be an issue if, like, her particular supervisor wasn't so much of an asshole. There's some interesting... I didn't love it, but I didn't hate it. But, I don't know, it's worth mentioning that if, if you are interested in reading it... Here, let me put this thought in your head to pay attention to this. Um, the presentation of the black laborers in this camp um, is interesting. Um... Oh, I already took my tabs out of here. Um, so it's recent enough after slaves have been freed that there's clearly still a racial divide. And what the author portrays is that a lot of the black laborers still are not, a lot of the black people in this place in this time are not comfortable it's not necessarily that they are subservient to white people but they understand that like they they are the they're still the lowest on the totem pole there's like a scene where like the asshole um uh supervisor supervisor's not the word anyway whatever supervisor position is kind of asking them to shit talk someone who's white and they they don't 
they were clearly uncomfortable with that because while they do kind of want to agree with their supervisor because like you want to keep him happy they are also uncomfortable with being asked to speak badly about a white person and they they don't know what to do like they they're like it's clearly an uncomfortable position for them because it's like well we should we should be allowed to be critical of someone regardless of their skin color but we also know socially that's not really how things are yet um so it's an interesting situation the author kind of kind of really leans into the thing i didn't like was she in talking about the black characters it's very much they're not individuals it's the black characters i don't why that's probably not the word that she uses this book does not use the n-word worth worth mentioning that um but she really they're really not individual characters they're really just kind of like this monolith and it's very much like they were uncomfortable they didn't know what to do so i, I didn't like that they were generalized that their reactions and their discomfort and their thoughts were very generalized um um i did like that she tried to engage with the social hierarchy malleability of this time and i just don't i i I just don't, I don't know how I feel about it. I, I need, I need to bounce that idea off some other people. I'm not saying that I think every, every aspect of that portrayal was bad. I think it's, this is, this is, I'm trying to speak on it because this is part of a, a larger like book reviewer philosophy that I have of while I am not of that demographic and I will never be an expert in whether or not that portrayal is good, I feel like as review as book readers and a ca casual reviewer, but reviewer nonetheless, who does try to read books from many perspectives, um, I should get to the point where I can articulate whether I like or dislike something. I should be able to get to the point where I can pick up on when it's fucking bad and maybe when it's really good. And yeah, I'm gonna need some help with that stuff in the middle, but like sometimes I'll see a reviewer say like, like it has this representation. I am not of that demographic, so I will not comment on, so I am just not able to comment on whether it's good or bad. And I, if you really have no idea, okay, but I also encourage the thought of like, okay, but at some point you should have enough reference to have some opinion. So anyway, so my attempting to, to, to awkwardly talk about it is kind of based on that of like, I've picked up, you know, I picked up on an aspect I didn't like, and but then I found this other part interesting. I would like more input on whether or not it was well done or mediocre or was it just kind of meh or were there more aspects that were problematic that I didn't pick up on yet because other than that it's a solid historical fiction um you know it's a book you you for me <laughs> and my taste as someone who doesn't who isn't drawn to a lot of historical fiction it's a book you pick up in an airport bookshop you read it on the plane and the vacation, it's good enough to finish, and then you put it down and you never think about it again. Or at least me. I'm going to have very few thoughts about this ever again. Um, but not historical fiction is also just not really my jam. Um, I, I definitely have my favorites. There are definitely aspects of historical fiction that I like, but you know, I'm a fantasy bitch through and through. <laughs> next, oh, next is another uh, book I got in a Goodreads giveaway. This was an ebook copy. This is Panama Red. Um, who's the author? David Edward. This is kind of a, an espionage uh, action thriller. So this is also very much not my genre, but this, but, um, 
my father-in-law loves that genre and he tends to read the same like three authors over and over and over again so i'm especially like in goodreads giveaways and stuff um i keep an eye out for um espionage military action thrillers like jason bourne jack ryan um jack reacher all these j names all the all these you know very much that that kind of story so this was a book that i was like Pff. it's like it's a giveaway i it's very very low stakes <laughs> um if I get a copy, cool. That's the very long explanation of how I came to read a book that's really outside my normal genre. Um, so this takes place in Panama. Um, we follow Dirk Lasher, um, who's um, undercover operative. I mean, the, the other, you know, Pan Panama natives in his neighborhood know that he works for the U.S. government. Like, it's not very much a secret, but he's kind of their boots on their ground, kind of like surveillance information gathering person. Um, and he, let's see, he had a contact who gets kidnapped. Um, so, there, so the book opens with someone getting kidnapped, and then we later learn that, oh, that person was supposed to make contact with Dirk Lasher and tell him something, and the absence of that information clues Dirk in that something big is going on. Like, why was this person kidnapped? And then there's also this other stuff going on with, like, the local gangs. Um, and it turns into he teams up with... Uh, the DEA who are trying to bust some particular um, drug runners in the area and well Dirk Lasher is not really he's not really doesn't really give a shit about you know busting these drug runners like that's the DEA's deal not his deal um, and this also takes place like in the 80s so we're, we're dealing with whatever the US Latin American political tensions were at the time um, but some of his local contacts in his neighborhood um some family members get kidnapped as pressure and Dirk finds that you know it's basically like his his friend's family gets kidnapped that pisses him off in helping the DEA get into this compound he can hopefully find and rescue his friend's family members overall story arc solid action plotline fine there were some there were some specific things that I really didn't like. Um, first off, with the writing, it was weird because like as someone who doesn't read a lot of this genre, I was grateful for some terminology explanation, like explaining some military terms and acronyms and just other terms. But the author was very inconsistent with how he did it. Sometimes it would be just a parenthesis. This is what this acronym stands for. Sometimes it would be kind of clunkily inserted into the dialogue where it, like, even as someone who like doesn't work in that field, I'm like, you wouldn't say, you wouldn't explain what that is because the person you're talking to either knows what it is or doesn't need to know what it is, so you wouldn't use that word. Um, I I think this book would have benefited from a glossary, um, which would have been a little hard to access in an ebook format. And I also say like it's weird as someone who doesn't read that genre because like I was grateful for some of those explanations because I wasn't familiar with them. But I also know you know thinking about this as a potential like is this something my father in law would like? He already knows all that shit. <laughs> most of it and if he doesn't he's happy to like look it up he you know but that he you don't need to interrupt the story to explain what that is um so it feels like too introductory um <laughs> at the same time so didn't love that um also i fucking hated our villain our female villain because uh major trigger warnings for necrophilia really really blatant necrophilia also trigger warnings for descriptions of sexual assault towards women and children um the physical and sexual assault towards children it's the one rough scene is described from the perspective of a child so it's not super graphic because she's too young to really understand what's happening but it's still very clear what 
is happening. Um, so just trigger warnings for that. Um, but like that part was like, I mean, I don't love it, but it fits the story. The necrophilia aspect, like it's not a spoiler <laughs> because like it's in like the opening paragraph where we first meet this villain. The, the thing is like, it's, it's just shock value. It's just to communicate this is a crazy evil person. And there's a couple other scenes where she does this really bizarre unhinged stuff. And it's not for anything. You know, like the necrophilia never comes back to be a threat to someone else later in the story. Like, it's, it just sets you up to understand she's very bad. And I, I, like, I didn't like it because it was, like, lazy character depiction. <laughs> like, I, uh, anyway. I'm, I'm not upset that the necrophilia is in there. I'm upset that it didn't need to be in there. <laughs> it wasn't used for good storytelling. Um, so that's why I didn't like it. Um, now I have, you know, um, a, a point of reference of something in this genre that I can now judge other things against. Um, actually, a uh, sneak peek of uh, my December reads. I'm currently reading The Apollo Murders by Chris Hadfield, who is um, actually a former um, astronaut. Um, and this is another, like, military espionage um action thriller. And this one, I am enjoying so much more. Anyway, I'm only like a third of the way through, but um, already my reading experience is night and day with those. So anyway, okay, continuing on. Ooh. Next, we have uh, one of my favorite reads of the month, possibly one of my favorites of the year. Black Sun by Rebecca Rowan Horace. I am kicking myself for finally getting around to reading this. Um, actually, I I read this on ebook from my library and then found a secondhand copy when I was uh, Small Business Saturday book shopping. Um, I made a little reel <laughs> about it because I I may have blown my my book budget by a lot, but. But, you know, you know, you know, you walk into a bookstore, it's a small business Saturday, they have things on sale, you find some fucking gems. <sighs> twist, you know, you didn't have to twist my arm very far to make me justify spending a little more money. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is fantastic. This is a, a, an adult fantasy that takes place in pre uh, a fantasy version of pre-colonial um, America's kind of I actually the, here here's this fantastic map that's on the inside of the cover I think what this is this is Mexico the Gulf of Mexico coastline and then this kind of goes into like southern Texas area which makes sense because when they talk about like one of the cities it's like very much based in canyons I'm like yeah that sounds like um like Texan desert area um so I mean everything has different names so it that's why I say like it's a kind of a fantasy version but it's very clearly based on like the Aztecs and the um, other uh, indigenous peoples who were present in those areas before um, European uh, settlers made contact. So in this world, we have uh, one dude who goes through a mystical ritual to become a, a magical vessel for a crow god. Interestingly, part of that is he is physically blinded. So uh, we got some uh, disabled representation in here with him being blind and kind of relevant to my um, discussion <laughs> about discussing representation in books that I talked about with Swallow Hill. Um, I think the blind represent the blindness representation in this is good from what I can tell. Um, 
because uh, you definitely see him with various tutors and various experiences learn how to cope with his blindness because he was not born blind, but um, him learning to navigate the world without his vision. And yes, he does have some, some magical assistance at times, um, but um, the way he like just like learns to compensate for it and you know learns learns combat learns like car woodworking and carving skills um it's pretty cool it's pretty cool um so that's one perspective then we have a woman who she is a ship captain and she gets um bailed out from jail by someone who asks her to crew this voyage um saying like, hey, you basically have to have to cross this ocean um, within a certain time frame that is currently very dangerous to do because it's like getting into winter storms. Um, so it's kind of a risky, risky thing. She doesn't tell her crew until they are well on their way. But she has, she has her own kind of like ocean magic that could help her like if anyone's going to be able to do it it's it's someone like her but um the heritage that lends her that magic also has a lot of fear and superstition around it so um she has to contend with that at being this ship captain um and then our third perspective our third main perspective we have a couple other perspectives here and there um our third main perspective is from a high priestess of the sun in this like the capital city of this region of this empire um and she is dealing with a lot of political unrest and this kind of comes to heads with the um supposed destiny of the vessel of the crow god and the book ends with everyone kind of licking their wounds, but things are clearly not finished. So uh, I have book two on my wish list for Christmas. Um, and I'm very excited and eager to read book two. I fucking loved it. Hurrah! <laughs> Next, um, read a nonfiction, uh, The Planets by Dava Sobel, Dava Sobel. I listened to the audiobook for this and did not pay attention to how the author's name was pronounced. I'm sorry. Um, so this is a little nonfiction where we have an, an intro and then um, a chapter each dedicated to each of the planets in our solar system, including Pluto, because see, this was published in what year? 2005? 2006? So I'm not sure when... I don't remember exactly when Pluto lost its planet status. Um, anyway, so this was interesting um, because she includes a lot of mythology in here, um, which which it, it's just interesting. I like hadn't really seen this much like mythology and like poet and literary reference like when she's talking about each planet she's talking about not just like the astrophysics geology of you know the rock in space but also like human human civilization's history with identifying the planet in the sky and the mythologies that have formed around it and like the poems that have been written about it and you know how with the advent of new like telescope technology you know we started to how we came to discover more and more planets and how they came to be named and everything um so that i wasn't quite expecting that i was expecting there to be more science science in there um but it was interesting to have um, all of this other cultural reference about the planets. And of course, we get less of that the farther away we get, because by the time we discover, you know, the existence of Neptune and Uranus and all of that, um, we're in more of the modern era and we don't have a need or a, a cultural normalcy around creating mythology around this unknown thing. Um, so with that... 
I would say this is a very good space science nonfiction for somebody who is blind or low vision. Hey, interesting how all of these books are getting uh, tied together. I say that because this author, she gives a lot of visual emotive descriptions and some of that is when talking about the mythology and like the, the poetry that has been uh, uh, like famous poetry or literary descriptions um, but also just like in her description like she doesn't just say like it has a, a you know the the atmosphere is made of this particular um, element but that element gives it this particular sulfurous yellow glow and the clouds like the way she she, she describes things with an emotional layer that you don't I don't usually see in like strict science nonfiction so far um and I think and again so I say like like that's something I I think would um go over well if somebody is reading this who is blind or low vision because she's not just describing it's this color it's this shape but She's describing it in a way that conveys a lot of the subconscious emotional reactions we have to a certain kind of color, to a certain kind of, uh, you know, the glow of a comet or like, you know, when she talks about the mythological history of it, again, like she's bringing in a lot of these cultural and emotional descriptions to something that could be very straightforward and clinical. I say all that like it's very very interesting because it's different from a lot of stuff in this genre that I've read. It's not one of my standout favorites of the year but like that element is going to keep it. It's gonna stick in my brain for having this like very unique tonality to it. So cool. Oh also the physical version has some really cool um, illustrations in it, kind of these surreal illustrations. They, they don't really have much to do with whatever is being described on the up opposing page. I, again, mostly listen to it on audiobook. You know, the audiobook doesn't have image descriptions of these images and it doesn't feel like, like there's like a, a missing diagram or something, but it's just worth noting that the physical copy has those. Um, anyway, yeah, interesting. Glad I picked it up and glad I finally got around to reading it. Next, another lovely read, uh, A Snake Falls to Earth by Darcy Little Badger. So um, first off, super cute um, illustrations. And also, Naked Hardcover has our characters in human form on the front and then the animal form where applicable on the back. Um, and also, like, the physical book, it's fucking heavy. It's, like, it's got nice paperweight. Like, it's it's just a really well-designed object, in addition to being a very lovely story. So this is a young adult, um, a young adult fantasy, contemporary fantasy, that deals with um, indigenous mythology. Let's see. Darcy Little Badger is an enrolled member of the Leap and Apache tribe of Texas. Um, so it's a young adult. It's it's very cozy. It's um, also uh, Darcy Little Badger is most known, I believe, for Alatsuay. Um, that one had an asexual main character. This one also has an asexual main character, and you it's and the thing is like she's asexual, but it's like there's like one sentence that tells you blink and you'll miss it. Um, so basically it's like, here is a normal teenager having a story, having an adventure and without having to deal with a romance subplot because there's plenty going on. We don't need that as well. Um, so we follow, for most of the book, we follow two perspectives. We follow, what are their names? Nina is a girl of Lipan Apache heritage. She when her like great grandmother is is um, in the hospital, like on hospice, Nina um, records this the story from her her grandmother. But be, but her great grandmother is speaking in her native tongue, and um, Nina doesn't have an audio recording of it. She has like a translator app recording of it, 
but it doesn't know all the words. So kind of the, 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 her kind of life project is trying to learn more of, um, this language so she can more faithfully um, interpret what was it what was the story that was being told to her um, and with that she is uh, going to her grandmother's property out way out in rural rural Texas like in the, the remnants of an old ghost town um, no cell service no internet um, and learning that uh, basically she kind of learns um, about like the potential presence of um, animal people, like uh, mis uh, mythological animal people, um, in her world, and you know this was something that her great grandmother had um, contact with, and there might be kind of like a thin spot between the worlds somewhere on her grandmother's property. Um, so that's kind of like the first perspective, and then the second perspective is Snake, um, Ollie. Ollie is a cottonmouth, and he lives in like the parallel animal animal people spirit world, and he can transform between his true form, which is his snake form, and his false form, which is kind of a humanish form that tends that's like at first glance they look human, but it's like well they still got some fur on their ears, or you still have some fangs, or you still have some claws. Like if you look closely, you'll see the non-human elements, but like it's enough to, you know, speak in human tongues and, like, interact with a human if necessary. Um, and he is, is a young snake. He's finally out in the world, living on his own, making friends. Um, it's very cozy, just kind of, like, coming of age, learning, learning, um, growing up and learning story for most of the book. And then one of Ollie's animal friends falls very ill and because he's like a, a mythical, like a, um, a mythical animal spirit, it's representative of the health of his species on Earth. So Ollie uh, ends up traveling to Earth to try to figure out what happened, why, you know, is what's happening to the native species on Earth so suddenly? What's happening? Um, and with that, he runs into Nina, and um, they hatch a plan to try to f help the species that is in trouble um, and with that they also encounter someone who is out here um, searching for and hunting the mythical animal people um, and yeah it's it's very cozy it's very much about storytelling there's a, an interesting plot line I think this takes place in like either contemporary or like fantastical near future because Nina very clearly is like recording and telling stories on on something that's akin to YouTube um you know it's like the storyteller app and you know and they have like their viral content creators who are monetized and very wealthy and and stuff and she you know kind of like like a like a video diary and also like a chronicling of the mythology she has been recording these videos for years she hasn't they're not live they're not public she it's just that's kind of like where she is storing those videos um <clears throat> but, but she's kind of working up to one day um maybe making some of those videos go public and build build a build a brand of being a storyteller in her own right um so, you know, that's like a theme that was also present in Alazzo is like the, the, the theme of, of storytelling. Um, we also have very supportive family. We do not have, we do not have like absent or non-believing parents. We have very engaged, very supportive family structure. It's, it's very cozy. The ending, <laughs> the ending was like one moment where I'm like, is this, like, how is this going to get wrapped up? Is this going to have a sequel? I don't see anything about this habit being, like, a duology or a series. Like, how is this going to get wrapped up neatly? Oh, my God, what's going to happen? And then, like, the way it does get wrapped up is very satisfying. Um, so, yeah. It's weird. I feel like I'm, I'm gushing about it. But, but also, like, there's something about, like, cozy stories. It's like, I like them. But, I don't know, compared to something like Black Sun, it's like but I love this. I love the high stakes. I love the imperfect people. I love the messiness, <laughs> um, the backstabbing, the drama. Like, I love this. 
And this, it's like, I like it a lot. It's very cozy. It makes me feel happy. I, you know, I feel like rested and rejuvenated. But is it like one of my favorite reads of the year? I, mm, I, I don't know if it's just going to sit in my feelings. It's not going to like leave as strong as an impression. And I think that's just personal preference. I think if you are all about cozy, cozy stories, stories that don't stress you out, that aren't, you know, don't walk the edge of like triggering content or whatever. If you are want gentle fantasy, cozy stories, like I think if you haven't already read Darcy Little Badger, like highly recommend it. And next we have another nonfiction. Oh my, I finished three nonfiction in one month. Granted, it took me like six weeks to actually read Omnivore's Dilemma, but you know, the fact that I'm, I mean, it is, I mean, it was November, nonfiction November was kind of inspiring to read more nonfiction. Um, we don't need that in there anymore. All right, The Genius of Birds by Jennifer Ackerman. This is a nonfiction that talks about um, intelligence in birds. I think like the summary of it is is not really much more complex than that. Um, what is interesting is, you know, she does have this point where she talks about like, the thing is like, we don't really like to use the words intelligence or, or, you know, how smart is something because like, it's so hard to judge what, what is intelligence, you know, from, from like a scientific testing aspect. So they basically test different cognitive complexities, like a bird's ability to remember where it hid seeds or, you know, it's navigational ability or, you know, it's ability to problem solve and being able to re like solve a puzzle to reach a piece of food. And the thing is like in that, I think what's interesting about this book, like why would you read the, like it, let's say you were not particularly interested in birds. Why would you want to read this? Because this book talks a lot about how neurologically humans study intelligence and study brain development. Um, and of course, like we always are, are comparing it to the human brain because that's what we understand the most because we as human beings can kind of articulate what are we thinking? What are we feeling? We can, t we have, you know, language and understanding of emotions and memory and passage of time and trauma and puzzle solving and social hierarchy and all of, all of these kinds of things. So of course, you know, the, the human standard is what we have to compare to. Um, but yeah, but it's very interesting how scientists um, try to convert, you know, our standards to how, okay, how do we test a bird's ability to do this? How do we, how do we get a bird to participate in these tests? How do we, you know, especially out in the wild, you know, trying to test the birds in an organic as environment as possible. Um, so I think if you're interested in science and if you're interested in um, evolution and like human brain development, human psychology and neurology, um, I think there's a lot of information in here that sheds light on um, our own scientific processes about these things in general. And here we're just talking about how they have been applied to birds specifically. Um, I think the one thing that it's kind of, I wish I had seen a little bit more of in here, um, at the end of the book, she talks about like some like environmental concerns, like as like temperatures on the planet are changing, um, like certain birds on a mountain range have to move higher, but because mountains are pyramid shaped, that means there is less territory for the birds to live in and what that is doing to their population. Like that's one example. And there's a, a couple other things where she's talking about like um, climate change and human impact on the birds. But I wish there had been a bit more of that. I mean, granted, I, that's not really what the book is. It's not like a climate justice call to action kind of book. Okay. Um, it's about what have we learned? What have we witnessed in birds about their intelligence? And how is that contrary to a lot of our language about birds like you know if you say someone is kind of bird brained the implication is they're not very smart so yeah it was it was interesting um again not one of my my standouts of the year i think the focus is like a bit too narrow i think um i would have liked a bit more 
a bit more connection to broader scope things, but uh, totally solid, liked the writing. This was one of the books I had picked up after reading Braiding Sweetgrass, and I was like, oh, like, gentle <laughs> nonfiction, something that is not, um, something that's not going to be super emotionally difficult um, and make me rage at the world. Um, looking at my bookshelf, I'm like, Braiding Sweetgrass is sitting right next to the new Jim Crow and tonally how fucking different those books are. So anyway, after reading Braiding Sweetgrass, I was kind of on the hunt for um, nature nonfiction that um, wasn't so high stakes. That was a little bit more like, let's just take some joy in exploring our natural world. An interesting read. Glad I picked it up. Cool. Last book. This was a romance I checked out from my library on Impulse. This is Duke of Sin. Um, this is book 10 in the Maiden Lane series. This is the book series that has a uh, Regency Batman. Um, not all the books do, but that, uh, the, this, this vigilante character, the Ghost of St. Giles, is a recurring, um, character in the series. So this book, um, it's kind of a return to the underlying, um, overarching, uh, dark plot that is tied to the Ghost of St. Giles, which is we are following the mysterious Lords of Chaos, which are these... Um, privileged, wealthy men in this society who um, gather together. They're kind of like this, this dark cult of badness. <laughs> and they are behind a lot of like organized crime and exploitation in the city. Um, and uh, the members tend to be very wealthy lords and members of parliament and everything. So it's kind of been this ongoing um, underlying plot of trying to fight against some of the things that they are behind and also try to figure out who are they and bring them down. So with that, we are following the Duke of Montgomery. His name is Valentine. Um, he goes by Val. And he is someone we saw in an earlier book who has ties to the Lords of Chaos. He's like the half-brother of a young woman who was the target as a child of the Lords of Chaos, and he actually saved her from them. So in this book, we discover his backstory and his connection to the Lords of Chaos. Um, he is also, um, we, we, we are led, we up until this point, we are led to believe that he's also, if, if he is not a Lord of Chaos, he is otherwise a very awful, unlikable person. Um, he blackmails a lot of people. He's very manipulative, um, <clears throat> very powerful, so very much entrenched in society, um, but people don't like him. People are afraid of him. So he's, he's an alpha hole, <laughs> you know, that romance trope. And, um, he, in the story is a developing romance between him and his housekeeper, Bridget, who... Um, is kind of a mole in his household. She, like, she is a very good, very, very um, talented, disciplined housekeeper, even for someone as young as she is. Um, you know, she's very fucking good at her job. Her being good at her job has allowed her to infiltrate his household. You know, she's been hired by a couple of people to try and find these incriminating letters or other things that um, Val has as evidence of blackmail against them. So she's kind of working undercover to figure out, to like find these things. Um, there's an aspect of that that is like her own personal history involved in that. So Val kind of catches her at it, um, doesn't fire her. He's more like, okay, you are more interesting than you. You're not as straight laced as you seem. You seem kind of interesting. Of course, he wants to find her secrets. He wants to figure out who is she. Um, but, you know, they are also very temperamentally well-matched in, like, their stubbornness and their perseverance and, like, their strength of character. So that is what kind of draws them to each other. Um, anyway, so the romance dynamic is very interesting because it kind of feels similar to book one, which I didn't really like. It, like, the first three books in the series are definitely the weakest in the series. I started with book four, which is how I fell in love with the series. Um, but it's, a, yeah, that alpha hole dynamic of we're given this very 
unlikable, morally, not even morally gray, quite morally black male character. Um, and there's a bit of, see, the first book had a bit of, well, he's so, he, he is attracted to and then is soft and soft towards this one particular woman, love interest. And in the first book, there's a little bit of like, she can change him. She's the one who can change him. Uh, you know, my modern feminist self is kind of like, honey, don't bother. Like, <laughs> like, no, you can't change him. He has to choose to change himself or not. You can't save him. <laughs> you can't save him if he doesn't want to be saved. Um, anyway, so, but what this book does differently is, um, she, is our character Bridget is like, she's not trying to save him. She is just, drawn to him and I, and I think it's like because she's not um a society lady because she doesn't come from a wealthy background herself she's intrigued by his power and the way he chooses to use it and the way he also tries to like why like what is his his fear of not having enough power and we learn that it's because of his history with lords of chaos where he's like blackmailing and manipulating and being this asshole is his means to get enough power to never be hurt again. You know, he's, he, like, he's got a shit ton of trauma and he's just trying to never be vulnerable again. Um, and, but she's very drawn to this person who has enough power that he can say, fuck the rules. And she finds that very intriguing. And I, also what I like about this dynamic is I think the author does a better job of not asking us as the reader to fall for this guy. She's like, I know that he's unlikable. I know he's a fucking alpha hole. Like, he's not really a good guy. Like, we learn that he's not the worst of them, but it's more about following Bridget's particular attraction to him um, and, like, the, the chemistry between them and the way that they finally are able to admit their attraction to each other. Um, but yeah, but I like that it's, you know, we're not shown that he has this other soft side or, like, we're not using his trauma as a way to, to excuse and forgive the shitty behavior he does. Just the way that she, that, this, uh, that the author treated this dynamic in this book, I liked it. It's still not my favorite dynamic. I don't particularly love, you know, he's an asshole to everyone except her, therefore that makes it him hot and okay. Um, but I feel like this, this story had a bit of self-awareness of that. I, yeah. Anyway, anyway, um, yeah, I like, I like this book more than, like, the couple, the couple previous that we had in the series, and I think it's, a lot of it is the, my favorite books in the series are the ones that deal heavily with the Ghost of St. Giles, or the ones that really hone in on the Lords of Chaos plotline, and when we have, like, another book that's more removed from that, that's when I'm like, this is not the most interesting part of this world. <laughs> Um, anyway, we've, we've only got, like, I think two novels left and then a couple of, like, in-between novelettes. So, I don't know if this series is finished. It's been a couple years since since the last book came out. I feel like I remember hearing that it was finished. But anyway, yeah, I'm excited to see. Like, we're clearly getting to a point where we're going to have a head-on clash with Lords of Chaos. Um, we're also getting close to a book where... Uh, we have a female Ghost of St. Giles, because we learn that Ghost of St. Giles, like the Dread Pirate Robert, it's not a person, it's a title. And there have been multiple iterations of this person, and in an upcoming book, one of the, one of the ghosts is a woman, rather than one of these men. I'm excited for it. I'm excited for it. Great. Okay, that's the video. Um, I hope you have a good rest of your day. I encourage you to go out into the world and be curious. I will leave my social media and other places where you can find me in the description box below, along with those that information about the HarperCollins strike. So don't forget to check that out, please. If you have made it this far in the video or just want to let me know you're here and don't really know what to say, can you leave me some kind of food emoji? I will catch you folks in my next video. Bye.